Good afternoon, good evening. I'm Ramesh Ratnazar from Bloomberg Business Week, and uh, it's a privilege to be moderating this um, distinguished panel. We have the uh, slight misfortune of uh, having to cover the entire world in an hour, uh, and we have the great misfortune of being the last panel before cocktails. So uh, I'm sure everyone's getting a little touchy. We'll try to uh, move this quickly and make it as lively as possible. But I also um, certainly want everyone here to um, participate if they, if they would like. So we'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I think there are a lot of issues and a lot of people here who, who would like to, uh, to comment on some of the things we're going to talk about. So um, I'm not going to introduce formally uh, the panelists here, but I want to uh, make a special welcome to Anne-Marie Slaughter. Um, <laughs> And, and since you're here, Anne-Marie, and, and uh, we have the benefit of calling on your expertise, um, I figured we should just start with the, um, the most pressing foreign policy issue facing the United States today, and that is what to do in Syria. Um, I, I think I speak for a lot of people in this room. Um, I think a lot of Americans, uh, certainly many members of the administration, um, when I say that obviously this situation is deeply alarming, gets more alarming every day, uh, but at the same time, uh, I and I think a lot of people here are, are uh, deeply conflicted about uh, whether the United States uh, should get involved um, in a situation that, that uh, uh, really seems to be degenerating every day. So um, I'm just wondering if you could tell us, in your view, uh, short of uh, military action, and it could come to that, um, what are the options that are available uh, to the United States at this stage, uh, or have we reached a point where uh, should we intervene, we would only uh, be making things worse and not better? Uh, so now I'm going to pick up on the, the last panel where Maya was. I'm not, I'm not optimistic. I, uh, the, the first thing to say is there are no good choices. There's simply no good choices here. This is a disaster. It is a horrific humanitarian and strategic disaster that has gotten steadily worse and is going to get much worse yet. Uh, and for, you know, it's been two plus years. It started uh, as a political opposition movement uh, that really was Sunni-led, but more against a dictatorship than sectarian. It has been Assad's desire from the beginning to make it a sectarian war, and he succeeded. Uh, and uh, so that's the first thing to say. And we have said uh, from the beginning, well, we couldn't arm anybody because we couldn't figure out whom to arm, and there were lots of people who we didn't want to arm, and that has become certainly a self-fulfilling prophecy. It has gotten worse and worse and worse. Uh, so that uh, I guess the way I look at it, at this point, if you don't do anything, uh, and if I'm a betting person, I still have to bet that we won't, notwithstanding the fact that I think that's completely wrongheaded. Uh, but if I'm just betting, I, I don't think this president wants to do anything, and I don't see things that are really going to change his mind other than uh, Assad using massive chemical weapons. Uh, and already, I mean, Obama basically said, you can do it as long as you don't do it systematically. Right? I mean, that's what he said. He said he, his first was a red line, and then when he came back, he said no systematic use of uh, chemical weapons. And what that means is it's okay. I mean, I'm not saying Obama's endorse, endorsing it. I don't think that. But he's, he's saying we're not going to act unless it's, it's really uh, big. So I don't think we're going to act, but that means we have to look at the prospect, you know, that we've got 100... 80,000 dead now, could be 100, could be 200. You've got 1.5 to 2 million people outside the country. That will simply continue. And then you start looking at, well, okay, as the country disintegrates completely, uh, as uh, Assad and his and the Alawites move to an Alawite mini-state on the, on the Lebanese border, then you see Syrian Kurds looking at joining a Kurdish state across the border in Iraq and Turkey. Uh, you see tremendous continuing destabilization in Iraq as the Sunnis who are fighting uh, in Syria are also across the border fighting in Iraq. Uh, and destabilization of Jordan simply, and, and Lebanon already, but Jordan simply by version of the, the number of, of, um, uh, of refugees. So 
you know, if we're prepared to live with that, uh, we shouldn't do anything because that's and and we can it, it could well be a couple more years. Uh, there are people who say and uh, you know don't advocate but say pretty openly what's really going to happen here is the redrawing of the colonial borders. That means there won't be a Syria or a Lebanon or an Iraq as we know them now. That the the colonial borders, the Sykes-Picot Treaty. Those are actually coming undone. A very prominent foreign policy commentator just said recently, that's the phase of history we're in. Well, if that's true, that looks like the 30 years war in the Middle East. I am assuming it won't be 30 years, but that's what happened in Europe until you got finally states that were defensible. I don't think we can, we can stand for that. I think that means we are going to have to intervene, and then we have to intervene militarily because, no, I don't see anything else that you can do. I mean, you can, you can try to arm the people who are still relatively secular and focused on a pluralist Syria. I don't think at this point it's enough that they will win it. And you're seeing very clearly the Russians and the Iranians dig in on the other side. So it seems to me if, that, if we're serious about doing something, I think we have to do something military. That doesn't mean boots on the ground. It probably does mean taking out his air force. Uh, with either cruise, with cruise missiles and or planes uh, do, and possibly setting up some kind of no-fly zone. But I would start uh, with, uh, with simply saying, look, we're going to make it a lot harder for you to kill people from at least from the air. And I would only do that, though, and I think we could get this support if we get the support of the region. I mean, it sounds as if what, in a way, what we're saying is that the longer we stay out, the more likely it is eventually we're going to have to get in. Is that... Uh, sort of the, the kind of diabolical choice we're facing at this point? Well, uh, no. That's the, that's the choice we're facing if you believe, as I do, that we simply can't afford to have Syria come apart completely and have that part of the Middle East in open conflict across multiple countries over a period of years. I'd, I'm not certain that the president's making that calculation. And, and I, I think the president may be making the calculation that as it gets worse, as you said, the re, it's more reason for us to stay out. And no matter what, it gets harder. The cost of intervening get higher and higher, so we're just going to stay out. I, I, so I don't think we have to. I think we have to only if you make the strategic calculation and the moral calculation uh, the way I make it. If... It comes to pass, at, at, let's say hypothetically, that um, the, the United States does get more involved in a deeper way, in a more aggressive way, and possibly involving military action uh, in Syria. How, um, and I think this is something that we probably, policymakers are going to be thinking about going forward. I mean, how do we limit, is there a way we can limit our involvement? Or is it the case that once you get involved, uh, there is, there is no way to sort of wall off, um, you know, your engagement. And is there a risk if, if the United States does get involved here that this will essentially overshadow everything else, that all of the foreign policy priorities the administration might have in the second term uh, essentially get pushed, pushed aside because uh, the bureaucracy, the, the, uh, the political uh, energy is all focused on, on managing Syria? Um. Well, I, it, so let's just start with what the right precedent here is. I don't, there are plenty of examples where it hasn't spilled over, right? Let's start, ex, Iraq and Afghanistan, neither has a bearing on what we were talking about. In both cases, we had massive ground troop invasions where we destroy the government and then are in charge of whatever ha happens afterwards. No one is talking about that here. Absolutely not. So the precedents seem to me to be much closer. Kosovo is probably the best one. Libya no-fly zone over Iraq, East Timor, any one of the places where we have said we are going in for a combined humanitarian strategic purpose but with a limited use of power. 
we've been able to walk out, right? If we decided to take out his, again, with the approval of and the participation of people in the region to knock out his air force, I don't see why that commits us to then, you know, being in Syria for the foreseeable future. What it might do, however, is force the chain, the, the people in Syria to change their calculations about whether or not they're going to fight to the death or it's worth trying to, to broker some kind of deal. Not that I'm all that optimistic, but at least I think I think you have to try. So I don't. I, I think Syria is going to overshadow everything that this president wants to do, whether or not we're in. And the longer it goes, the worse it's going to get. I just don't think the argument about how we're going to be enmeshed in Syria the way we were in Iraq has any standing or any basis in the reality of what people are actually recommending we do. Last question on this, because I think we do want to talk about other things. But um, since we are talking about uh, the United States and the world going forward, um, what do we do about the next Syria? I mean, what lessons do you think uh, policymakers can draw from this tragedy that we're witnessing? And uh, do we have any kind of way uh, in which um, we can intervene in sort of a preventative way to uh, stop the next Syria from degenerating into, into the, to the point where it is today? Well, I actually think the lesson, uh, Libya is not in great shape by any means, but I still would put to you that Libya is in far better shape than it would have been had we not intervened. I mean, if Gaddafi had, in fact, gone into Benghazi and wiped out as many people as he could, the civil war would have continued, would continue now. Uh, I think Libya is an example of responsibility to protect that worked. Uh, there are things we could have done better in terms of, of what we did when we were in and, and how much we did beforehand. Uh, I don't see why we've run so far away from the responsibility to protect now. In fact, the Russians said, well, you know, you guys cheated us. Everybody who was there in the UN when the Russians voted for the Libyan intervention says they knew exactly what was going to happen. I mean, Susan Rice says, I laid out everything. The British people, the British representatives say the same thing. Uh, and yet we've backed away from that when, in fact, of the only way to get to a situation where you can actually intervene early enough to make a difference with lower cost is to strengthen the norm that when a government starts massacring its own people at scale, uh, you can intervene and indeed you really uh, you have the legal right to intervene and that it is not only the right but the smart thing to do. So we have actually seen that norm strengthened remarkably by the standards of international lawyers. I mean, it was passed in 2005. Normally these things don't get used for decades. Uh, but we seem to have actually pulled back in a way that I think is weakening our case uh, going forward. Let's switch gears a little bit, because I do think um, these kinds of panels on foreign policy often just become panels about crises and conflicts. Um, and I think we want to talk about some of the opportunities um, that the United States has uh, going forward as we look toward 2020 and beyond. Um, and Steve, you've written uh, extensively, and as well as anyone I know, um, about uh, energy and how uh, the energy boom in the United States is uh, changing. Uh, and has the potential to change uh, our relationships with a whole host of actors abroad and, and in a lot of ways change our geopolitical calculations. Can you talk about um, how going forward uh, the domestic energy boom is going to change and reshape uh, our foreign policy choices? Sure. The first thing I want to do is, is just broaden that out a bit. The, the, way the narrative goes usually when we hear it here in the United States, it's very uh, US focused. The boom is going on all around the world. So the oil and gas boom, North America, South America, Africa, East Mediterranean, Kurdistan, Australia. And so uh, all of the, well, let me start over by, by saying in, in, in terms of framing the geopolitics uh, that we look at over the last five years or so, we have tended to focus on, on soft and fuzzy um, things, the social media, what, what impact Twitter or Facebook or, or whatever is, ha is having on events. And I think what we've discovered is that 
there are a lot of hard things, hard rocks in the, in the world. And, and what are they? Well, one of them is Assad. He's not going to flip like Mubarak. Iran, we th uh, 2009 was a very big year. That probably started this thinking with the, the Green Movement and Twitter and its impact on the election then. But it didn't, it didn't overturn Iran either. And the other hard thing that hasn't changed, we thought that clean tech, biofuels, algae, solar, wind, batteries, we're going to uh, revolutionize the world, change economies, uh, and, so, and so on. And, we, and, and what we've discovered is that it's a lot harder to, uh, to move the needle there. And the hard thing is oil. The hard thing that exists in, in the superstructure, immovable, it, it is that there is a lot of oil in the world and gas. Um, and, and now a lot of it is being drilled. So that, uh, that being the, the case, what's the impact of that? The, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll run through some of the stuff that we're seeing right now, but uh, ju uh, just to, to fast forward and, and just give the ending first, there are a lot of good, a, a lot of positive potential impacts from this oil and natural gas boom. So the uh, IEA, a few days ago issued a report, it's, it's medium term report, so it goes until 2020. Next year, the, the, the big thing that's, that, uh, that's caused the world a lot of trouble and sent oil prices through the roof is that there's no surplus on the market. So, the, so there's a, a, a very, very tight balance between what, how much oil is produced and how much oil is demanded. And what happens then is that oil traders who, who bet like in a casino, they bet on the next thing. There's no oil, there's no spare oil. They bet, what if Saudi Arabia has a revolution? What if there's another Hurricane Katrina? What if a bunch of Somalis seize a bunch of oil tankers off the, off the east coast of Africa and suddenly there's a shortage of oil on the market and so on, and then they bet they uh, they uh, trade oil prices up, and that's why we've had oil prices above $100 a barrel for for two years running, um, and why they went up to $150 a barrel in 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 2008. IEA has forecast that next year there will be seven million barrels a day of surplus oil. That so the so the world consumes 90 million barrels, that's a huge surplus. That, that if, if, if it is correct, and IEA is, is a conservative body, oil prices starting next year and running at least until 2020, this forecast is until 2020, are going to crater. Oil prices will go, you know, we can guess, right? Uh, below $80 a barrel. Gasoline prices in the United States will go down with them. Look at who relies. Just there's there, there's a uh, there, there's a host of countries that have been very powerful for three or four decades that rely on oil prices being a, you know the balance between what is the price of oil and how much can they pump. For OPEC countries, the break-even point since the Arab Spring, and they they've increased their spending in order to make social payments, so a number of them don't have the same uprisings that Egypt did and that Tunisia did, $99. The average price of $99 a, a barrel, Russia needs 117, Iran needs 117 to break even, to make the payment. So if, pri if the price goes down to 80 average and stays there, the key point is it sustained there, there's suddenly cracks in the, the uh, edifice for those nations. The geopolitics change, the, the, the ability for Saudi Arabia to, to pull its weight around uh, the globe, for Venezuela to have weight to push around in Latin America, for Iran to be able to defy the world, that changes. And Russia, Russia is a, is a big example because it depends on gas and oil. So it's caught between a, a, a rock and a hard place. Europe's 
appetite for gas is dropping. It's demanding lower natural gas prices. U.S. gas is coming on the Obama administration today, uh, approved another export facility for U.S. LNG. U.S. LNG is, you know, is about to pour onto the global market. That will send prices lower. So Russia's break-even points, Putin's ability to support his state, his ability to go around the world and defy uh, the, the UN Security Council to, to, to send his ships. So he's had ships for several months in, in Syria, off the Syrian shore, will be, will be less. And the other, the other part of his e equation is that China is holding back. China, if he can't sell to Europe, he can sell to China. China's been holding back for six years, waiting for this day. It won't agree. China won't agree to his price. He's going to have to agree to a lower price. Let me just close out by, by talking about China. What is China's rock? What is the immovable uh, uh, thing in China's world that means that it's going to have to move? Pollution. So th those days in January in which, which you could see this far in front of your face and Chinese people were in the streets and wealth, uh, when, when, when people gain wealth, they gain aspiration and expectation. The, the, the uh, uh, calculus in China, the Chinese Communist Party <coughs> has always been, the Chinese people will accept pollution if they have jobs. That calculus is changing now, right? The, the, the Chinese people also want to live they want to live better lives. They want their ch children not to die young. They want their children not to die at all. Right? And, and so, so there's a, a push to have cleaner air. And that means that, this, that this, um, this appetite that's built into our models, economic growth models, the CO2 models, climate change models of what's going to happen over the next uh, two or three decades based on Chinese consumption of oil and gas may be very different. Chinese may f find a way to burn a lot less fossil fuels. So just to um, you know, put this in the context of sort of our strategic choices, I mean, one of the hopes was, you know, after, particularly after September 11th, was the idea that uh, if the United States could attain energy independence and, and essentially wean itself off of uh, foreign oil, we could sort of insulate ourselves from all of the mess of problems uh, that we've had to deal with in the Middle East. Do you think that that is uh, realistic? Uh, it certainly doesn't seem that that's come to pass at, at this point, but do you think by 2020, if we're sitting here in, at, on this stage, uh, we're still going to be obsessing and talking about and, and I'm going to be asking Anne-Marie five questions about uh, how to intervene in some conflict in the Middle East, or do you think that we will have essentially broken the fever because of uh, uh, these changes in the energy markets? All right. So we, we, in, in, in our house, we have bananas in the kitchen. We always have bananas in the kitchen. So I have a question for you. Should we be banana independent? <laughs> we import all these bananas. I don't think so. <laughs> so this is, this, this is a, it's a, a mantra, that, it's an empty mantra of, of, of it's, it's, it's a, um, a yearning that we have had since the um, OPEC, the, uh, the, rise, the real rise of OPEC going back to 1973 where we lost control of our own economy, of our own future, and I felt that. And, try, and, and, and desiring desperately to have that back. And that, all of that has been wrapped up in, the, in this energy independence goal. So it's not a, uh, it's, it, it, there are good reasons to, uh, to be able to drill a lot of oil, drill a lot of gas, be able to sell that and so on. But it's not because you want to be energy independent. It's re reasons of uh, balance of payments, there are reasons for having cheap feedstock for manufacturing base, for changing geopolitics, for not being in, in bed, not having to be in bed with OPEC, 
for example, but we can still buy from OPEC, we can still buy from Nigeria and Venezuela and, and, and not hurt ourselves at all. Can I add one sure. thing? Just the other geopolitical consequence, which you may have touched on, but the, with liquid natural gas rather than pipeline, you're also really decoupling Russia and Europe, right? In other words, when, when Russia tries to put the squeeze on Ukraine, at least from what I gather uh, from people in the industry, increasingly France will be able to sell whatever LNG it has to Ukraine so that it doesn't actually have to count on pipelines, which makes a huge difference in terms of the geopolitics of Europe and Russia. Emily, I guess we should uh, talk about uh, what Steve referred to as the warm and fuzzy things like <laughs> the internet and the social media, which I, I think in your view are, are anything but insignificant. Um, again, this is another area in which there are opportunities for the United States um, in promoting our, our values and our interests if we can uh, figure out the right ways in which we can harness these technologies. I mean, based on, on the research you've done, both inside and outside government, um, what, what do we know now? I mean, what are, what are the kind of uh, uh, things that we've learned about uh, the way in which the internet and social media and mobile communications um, can affect democratic change, and uh, what are the ways in which we've run up against some of the limits of what, of what those technologies can do? Okay, so we're well, focusing on democratic change specifically. I think that sometimes people phrase the question in slightly the wrong way. So we've, there's been a lot of talk over the past few years. You know, For a while, everyone was really excited about the potential for Twitter and Facebook to cause revolutions in various parts of the world. And I think now we're in a period where we're experiencing the backlash. People are really disappointed. And they're saying, well, you know, it doesn't really work. It doesn't create revolution. People look at China and they say, well, China has all these you know, hundreds of millions of people on the internet. Why isn't there a revolution there? And I think the most simple way to explain this, and this is obviously a very long conversation, but when people ask me about this, I usually quote um, Lenin, which I don't usually do, but I will in this case, who, who said, and this was actually quite right, that for a revolution, you need a revolutionary situation. And so I think that the mistake sometimes people make is talking about social media as if it's this kind of independent phenomenon. Like, will social media cause revolution? But social media doesn't really do anything independently. It just complements the current reality. So I think, you know, and we saw this in Egypt as well. Social media didn't cause anything in Egypt. There was a moment that was, it was ripe for revolution. And what social media does do is it lays the groundwork and it creates the networks and makes things happen faster and one could say more, more effectively but it doesn't cause anything. So I think what we're seeing in, in countries you know, like China and, and, and like Russia, you know, when in Russia is another example where in 2011, there were all of a sudden after years of apathy, there were tens of thousands of Russians on the street and social media played a pivotal role in, in, in organizing those protests. However, Russia has had basically a free internet for years. So why didn't that happen years earlier? And the reason was people weren't at that point. So once people got to that point, it was, and the point was everyone was very frustrated with election fraud. And once they were ready and they were indignant enough to actually get out of their houses and protest, then social media came in. So I think sometimes there's just confusion a little bit about cause and effect. How, I mean, based on, again, uh, the work you've done uh, when you worked at the State Department and, and the work you're doing now, um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the, some of the best ideas out there about how uh, the United States, how practitioners of foreign policy can harness and employ um, these technologies in a way that uh, promotes our interests? Well, Anne-Marie can also speak to this very effectively, but I, I will just offer a few thoughts on that. Um, I think one of the, the greatest things that, that Secretary Clinton did, and I had the honor of, of working for Emory during that time, it was a really amazing time because Secretary Clinton really put internet freedom on the agenda in a way that no other Secretary of State had done before. And she did that in very many different ways, but most obviously by making two major speeches about the importance of internet freedom. So that alone kind of held the U.S. to a really high standard. You know, it wasn't, we're not perfect on this at all, but it kind of made the world look at us and say, well, you're telling us all about how important internet freedom is. Every time the U.S. seemed to in some way be erring on that front, everybody kind of pounced on the U.S. And that's, in a way, that's a good thing. I think it just raised the bar. You know, and then there's all sorts of, there were all sorts of programs that were happening at, at state. I mean, this, this term digital diplomacy, that everybody interprets in a different way. I think most simply it's 
leveraging new technologies to achieve foreign policy goals. One of the beauties of digital, beauty of di digital diplomacy, and I think this is something that some people at the State Department understand quite well, is that it actually doesn't need to entail any diplomats at all. I mean, that's the great thing about digital diplomacy, is that what's amazing about these connection technologies is that they allow citizen-to-citizen -citizen communication in a way that was never really possible. It allows diplomats to interact directly with citizens, and it allows diplomats to interact directly with one another, you know, kind of without the usual protocol that comes with that. I mean, you see these arguments happening between U.S. Ambassador to Russia, Mike McFaul, and um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Russia on Twitter. Now, these are usually not very, like, harmonious interactions, but they're happening. And that's that was previously impossible. And I think, you know, when it comes to Twitter specifically, it's radically changing diplomacy. And it's, of course, it's not always good, right? I mean, I think this has been this other sort of silly debate that's been happening over the past few years, which is like, well, is social media good or bad? And it's, it's neither, it's both. It's disruptive. It's clearly disruptive. And just one quick, one of the most interesting examples I've seen of Twitter directly impacting foreign affairs was, was with the Chen Guangcheng um, debacle, I guess. You know, he, uh, Chen Guangchang, I'm sure everybody knows, but the um, blind activist in China who escaped house arrest and made it to the U.S. Embassy. And I don't know if people remember, but when he first left the U.S. Embassy, there was this moment when it looked like this unequivocal triumph for the U.S. and China, because it was like, wow, they got him out so fast, and he was supposed to stay in China, and the U.S. was, was very victorious, and China was very victorious, and everyone was smiling and taking photos, and it was like, okay, end of story. And there was a moment in history where, like, that really would have been the end of the story. I mean, that was, like, that was the narrative. And I was, at, I was in New York at that time, and I was just at home kind of, like, reading through Twitter, and all of a sudden, I start seeing these crazy tweets coming from China. And it was just like, you know, and they were both in English and Chinese. These were Chen Guangcheng's friends. And they were just like, what the media reported was wrong. You guys are all wrong. You know, Chen Guangcheng was pressured. He was forced out of the embassy. He's miserable. This is a nightmare. It was just these like kind of dramatic, emphatic tweets. And what was amazing to watch was within the span, within the span of like a couple hours, the entire media narrative just what turned over because there's all these you know western reporters who are on twitter they're reading these tweets and they suddenly all the stories are getting rewritten and all of a sudden the u.s government who you know an hour before had been completely triumphalist was on the defensive and the same for the chinese government and i probably changed history because chen guangcheng ended up coming to the united states now would it have happened without twitter probably but in that fast no and it would the u.s and china would have had a lot more time to kind of shape the public perception of events now, just quickly, you know, when I was talking about this at the time, some people were like, well, Twitter didn't play a, a positive, an ultimately positive function there. And I think it's just a really good example of the double-edged sword of Twitter. Because I think ultimately, you know, yes, Chen Guangcheng ended up maybe in a better situation. However, you know, it created a lot of misinformation because what came out in the days that followed was that the stuff on Twitter wasn't completely right either. So it was also, you know, there was also a lot of misinformation. But that just, I mean, that's just a very simple anecdote about how, you know, something as small as Twitter, and, and in Twitter users in China, there aren't even that many of them, but how they managed to kind of overturn the narratives of, of the U.S. and Chinese governments, so. Uh, yeah. you have a I'll just add one thing, which goes completely, one way to think about digital diplomacy is, you know, we have embassies because we assume it's really hard to get information from other countries, right? We go back to the only way to get information was to have a physical entity in another state that originally, with people in it, and they sent back dispatches and then cables and, and, now, and now emails. And that, you know, that determines the whole way we are set up to do foreign policy. The country desks have much more power in the State Department than anybody else because they are in touch with the embassies and people are on the ground. If you start thinking about the ability to communicate to people rather than to their governments, it totally changes the way you think about foreign policy strategy. So Secretary Clinton also had a strategy for young people, a strategy for women, a strategy for entrepreneurs, a strategy for scientists, because you don't have to think about going through the government to government and all its departments. You can start thinking about, well, who do we need to, to communicate with, and then what is the way to do that? So if you really push it, the entire structure of the State Department and of the way we think about foreign policy ought to change. 
And just one, one quick thing, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this too. I think the biggest challenge for any government going forward is going to be how to manage this because, you know, at first everyone's like, oh, this is so cool. Officials can use Twitter to communicate directly with the public. But the truth is, is that any official who's really been, you know, loose and, and flexible on Twitter has gone into trouble at some point, right? Because it's, it's just, it's, it's difficult. And I think it's, it's good to do that. It's good to not issue press releases, but it's, it's a high risk scenario. I mean, you look at, I gave the example of Ambassador McFaul. I mean, he's very outgoing on Twitter, but he's been attacked. He's gotten to all sorts of problems. The U.S. Embassy in Cairo is another one, which has like one of the more colorful Twitter feeds, but have also come on, you know, had a lot of public scrutiny. They've had problems with the Muslim Brotherhood. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And I think the more that Twitter becomes a part of U.S. foreign policy, it's like, where do you draw the line between, you know, diplomats being themselves and having a personality and not having to clear everything but then, you know, you run the risk of causing a diplomatic incident, so. You definitely have to have a much higher tolerance for failure. The, the Egyptian, our Egyptian embassy tweeted out John Stewart doing a parody of the Egyptian government taking down their John Stewart, which probably was not the best thing for us to be <laughs> sending out uh, as, a, as a government. So I, I agree with that. On the other hand, the... The potential, you know, our ambassador in New Zealand has more people following his blog and Twitter feed than read the New Zealand largest daily newspaper. So if your goal in diplomacy is to connect to another society, you've, you've done something enormous. I, I believe that the Chinese, our, our embassy in Beijing, their, the Twitter account that actually puts out the uh, pollution levels yes. every day is because it's a huge impact on, uh, on uh, public opinion. Um, Charles... I wonder if we can get you to talk about everything else. Um, uh, you know, we've been working together it, more than I think either one of us would like to admit over the last two years, quite a bit. Uh, but uh, one of the themes that always comes out in your writing um, and that I, I really find resonant is the idea um, that a lot of the innovations uh, that do the most to help the most number of people in the world are actually incredibly cheap. And um, I'm just wondering whether you can uh, identify some of the opportunities uh, for the U.S., for, for the world, really, uh, over the next 10 years, uh, in which we can really make a meaningful difference uh, in fighting things like global poverty and disease, uh, and do so for uh, you know, a fraction of what we're spending uh, you know, fighting the war in Afghanistan, for instance. To some extent, if I knew the, the answer to that, I'd be rich, but... Uh, uh, uh... Then, you know, th thank you. I mean, the, the, the reason that uh, uh, incredibly cheap matters, obviously, is because most people in the world are incredibly poor. The, the, the U.S. poverty line, depending on the number of people in your family, kind of 1250 a day, give or take. Um, the median, not the average, but the median income in the world is around three bucks. Um, so half of the world's population lives on less than three dollars, and still about six hundred million live on less than a, a dollar twenty-five a day. Um, they can't afford expensive technologies. They don't have the money. They need to spend that money on on food and shelter. Um, it is amazing, therefore, how much technology has had a massive and and by and large very positive impact on poor people around the world. Just. Uh, the, the, the always cited example is smallpox, which is not killing anybody anymore and killed sort of 300 million people in the last century. Um, uh, and, and, you know, why? We had a vaccine, uh, uh, we, we spread it globally and we wiped out the disease. And, you know, measles has gone down from sort of 3 million deaths a year to 180,000 about worldwide, just over the last 20 years. In disease after disease, we are making massive progress uh, at, you know, a very low cost. Um, uh, uh, against death. Um, so, you know, that's just in health. Uh, uh, you know, the fact is that when it comes to the mobile phone, nearly all of the really exciting innovations with the mobile phone haven't come from Silicon Valley. They've, they've come from uh, uh, the developing world um, in you know, um, Africa, um, in particular when it comes to mobile banking. And, and PESA has just, you know, taken off like wildfire. And it's taken a country that had literally hundreds of banks for the entire country to a place where most people are actually using um, uh, uh, mobile banking. I mean, it's just you know, massive impact on uh, 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 access to financial services. So um, I do think it's an exciting time. I mean, you know, it's an exciting time because of the internet. It's an exciting time because of energy. And I, I mean, I, I take your point. It, it, it has turned out to be uh, harder to get renewable energy to be a big part of the global energy portfolio 
than perhaps we'd originally hoped. But if you look at things like solar-powered lanterns, um, they really are spreading quite rapidly throughout um, uh, large chunks of Africa which have no access at all to electricity. And what people were using before was either kerosene. I mean, a kerosene lamp in your house is about the same as smoking two cigarettes a day. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people year, yearly worldwide get burns when their kerosene lamp burns over, it turns over. It is you know, not a pleasant technology, and that's the second best technology. A lot of people are using candles or firelight. From that, we've gone to people using solar lanterns, which, by the way, can also power, power their mobile phones. Um, you know, these, these technology advances in a whole range of areas really are, are making a huge difference. But I, I kind of want to echo the point that you know, technology is great, but it's not. It really isn't the whole story. I mean, for mobile phone, you know, there are 5 billion mobile phone users worldwide, and there are still the majority of the world living on less than $3 a day. It's not that you know, technology is the answer to everything. There are institutional challenges, educational challenges, you know, huge other challenges that have been around since the dawn of time that we still have to deal with. But I think you know, sort of at the same level of institutional quality, at the same level of income, the quality of life for people worldwide has you know, never been higher. I guess one. We end there. Yeah, we probably should. <laughs> yes, but um, I, I, unless uh, everyone wants to go get drinks, uh, I think we have to keep going. Um, but let me just ask Charles. Um, you know, one, one thing that I think a lot, a lot of Americans have have a misperception: a that we spend a whole lot of money on foreign aid when we don't. Yeah. Um, uh, and secondly, that that the, the problems that uh, afflict much of the developing world are uh, re require huge amounts of money to solve. Um, I'm wondering whether you feel that the United States gets enough bang for its buck when it comes to development aid. Um, and if not, what can and should be done to uh, reorient uh, the way in which we spend uh, to, to get more results for our money? Uh, thank you for asking the question again, and apologies for, 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 for not answering it first time around. Um, USAID is a hideously dysfunctional organization. I feel incredibly uh, sorry for the people who work there. There are a lot of um, good people who are really committed to making the world a better place and are an institution that seems to be designed to frustrate them at every turn. Um, despite that fact, uh, uh, USAID uh, is, is actually doing something I think really pretty cool with something called DIV. It's a small, uh, in dollar terms, it's a small outfit in, 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 in USAID. It stands for Development Innovation Ventures. Um, and basically what they do is they have this wonderful model of saying, look, come in with a, it doesn't have to be a tech solution, but a solution to a problem that you think uh, uh, might make a, a, a difference to a lot of people in the developing world if you could scale it up. And what we'll do is we'll give you some money to you know, um, um, develop your idea, but really what we're giving you money for is to test if your idea actually makes a difference. And they use very good evaluation techniques to figure out if this idea that looks great on paper actually makes a real difference in the world. One of my, my favorite div uh, uh, grantees is, is, is something uh, that got the name Heckle and Chide. In, in, um, uh, in, in uh, Kenya, um, uh, uh, road deaths are becoming an absolutely major killer. Now, in a way, that's a sign of progress, right? Lots of cars. But uh, uh, it's also incredibly depressing. It's, you know, pedestrians, by and large, being, being, being mown down by bad drivers. A lot of those bad drivers drive matatus, the, the kind of uh, minibuses that, that provide a lot of, of, of public transport in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Nairobi. Um, these people had a very simple idea, you know, based on, on, on nudge and uh, 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 all the stuff that's got us uh, excited about, uh, 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 you know, techniques to nudge people in the right direction in the United States. It was basically, what happens if you just put up a, a sign in the Matatu saying, please complain if your driver is driving too fast? Yeah, it's clearly not going to work, is it? Stupid idea. Um, they tried it, and um, what they did was they monitored how often drivers made insurance claims on the ground that they'd just run somebody over and needed to make a payment. Um, and the, I can't remember, it was sort of a halving about of, of, of the number of, of, of insurance cases in the uh, Matatus which had this sign. And it was all sort of done in the way that you want these things to be done. It was randomized and uh, all sorts of stuff. It really was the effect of a simple sign. People actually started feeling empowered to complain about how bad their driver was driving, and drivers drove better, and that saved lives. The, what Div paid for wasn't the signs, which after all weren't actually very expensive. Um, they paid, I think, a little bit for um, 
encouraging drivers to keep the signs up by saying, look, if, if we still find the sign in your taxi three months later, we'll give you a small payment. Um, but mainly, actually, for, for, for designing the experiment to see if this thing really worked. It's, it's saved a lot of lives at, you know, I can't remember how large the grant was, 100,000 maybe? I mean, you know, uh, in, in, in US government budget terms, uh, not even a rounding error. Um, and made a, made a real difference. And Div is small and um, um, not liked by many on the Hill. And um, you know, they, too, struggle with uh, all the things that make USAID largely dysfunctional. Um, but they are making a difference. And I think if we could move towards a model that supported that kind of thing, alongside a, a, a model that you know, this is one way to encourage technologies that work. There are other ways to encourage uh, 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 technologies that work. Um, um, one that's worked very well is basically a bunch of donors came together and said pneumococcal diseases, killing a lot of people in the developing world. There's not a vaccine for this. If somebody out there develops a vaccine for this, here's $1.5 billion we're going to leave in this pot until somebody invents this vaccine. And when they do, we'll use that pot to buy a lot of the vaccine. Created a market, right? Um, uh, uh, now two or three drug makers have come up with pneumococcal vaccines. That money is being paid out to them, um, and those vaccines are being rolled out across the developing world, again, saving lots of lives. So there are lots of different ways of, of getting new technologies that we know will actually make a difference to the quality of life of people in the developing world out there. And, and I think the US has a natural advantage in that kind of thing, not just because, obviously, it's a powerhouse of innovation, but also, frankly, because it's a powerhouse of evaluation. Um, we have Jay Powell uh, in, in, in MIT, uh, 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 rubbed by uh, Abhijit Banerjee and, and S. Duflo. Um, you know, one of the, the, the world's leading places for doing good evaluations of small projects. Um, uh, and, and you know, that's just one of a, a number of, of examples. So both because of the sort of innovation talent in this country and because of the evaluation talent in this country, it's, it's a place where the United States has a real compar comparative advantage, unlike as it might be with food aid, where you know, hopefully the system is going to get better. But at the moment, the only way that the United States can um, uh, help feed uh, 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 people in a famine in Africa is by buying US grain and sticking it on US ships and f uh, shipping it there. If you're in a famine in Africa, the last thing you want to do is wait three months while the food gets shipped from the United States. It's the dumbest system ever. Now, hopefully, you know, one of the things that the administration, the administration is trying to do is, is reform that system. But there are lots of kind of aid that the United States does really, really, really badly. And if we could take some of that money, and, and, and move it over into, into areas like this, I think it could make a big difference. All right, I think we should uh, open it up for any questions folks might have for these guys. Um, and there's one right there, and another one here. Hi, I'm Maura O'Neill. I'm one of those sad employees at USAID. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually, along you with Michael Dib, Kramer luckily. at Harvard, yes. invented it. So, uh, so I'm proud. So I appreciate the uh, shout out. A couple things that actually was a two thirds reduction in injury related accidents, and uh, we spent a hundred thousand dollars to do a randomized control on a thousand. Um, Matatu buses. We are now spending more money to do 10,000, and the insurance companies have said if it works, they will actually require it of all Matatu buses. So, which gets me to my point, which I think is incredibly important, um, and that if for all foreign assistance, but thing we built into DIV, which is the all the applicants have to show how this is going to scale, either through the public sector as a public good or the private sector, but not with, that, not with USG support long term. And so think about sustainability at the front end. So I think that, in addition to the small amounts, has been pretty critical to, um, to, to changing the foreign assistance model. But I would love any, you know, since I am here, I would love anybody's feedback on the panel on uh, if you were in our shoes and uh, you could change one thing at uh, USAID uh, or our approach to foreign assistance, what recommendations would you have for us? <laughs> I had mine. Charles, I'm sure you have a few. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 um, food aid isn't really USAID's fault, but uh, 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 you know, uh, that would be one. And, and that, doing more div would be another. I honestly did not know Maura was in the audience when I... Uh, <laughs> 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 Shout it out for Div. Um, uh, I think moving away from uh, a model based all too much around uh, US many for-profit contractors uh, delivering things um, 
you know, in other places that would be better delivered by people in other places themselves uh, is really important. So if you take the mess that is Haiti uh, today, right, it's uh, 9 billion, I think, uh, of resources went into Haiti, sort of 3 billion from the US government, uh, uh, 3 billion from foundations, and, and, and 3 billion from, that's US government and US foundations, 3 billion from the rest of the world. Um, we can't track it. We don't know where most of that money went. It's hard when you go to Haiti to see where the money could have gone. Um, uh, we do know that a lot of USAID money went to people working in buildings within about 20 miles of where we sit now. Um, some of it then, we believe, although actually you can't get the data, some of it was then passed on to uh, people in Haiti. At the same time, Mercy Corps, for example, in, in, in Haiti, I think quite possibly with, with USAID backing, uh, was actually uh, taking some money, some small amount of money, and actually using mobile phone technology to get that money into hands of Haitians who could then use it to do whatever they thought they needed to do to recover from the earthquake. If we'd taken that $9 billion and spent a lot more of it, or just handed a lot more of it over to Haitians, that would be great. We handed less than 1% of the money over to the Haitian government. I know the Haitian government is corrupt and terribly inefficient. But the fact of the matter is, there is no country in the world that is rich, peaceful, successful, that doesn't have an incredibly strong government. You can't bypass the government and think that this is any long-term solution to the problems in Haiti or anywhere else. And so by Bypassing the Haitian government and the Haitian people and putting nearly all the money into the hands of US contractors, I do think USAID and the State Department and you know, lots of others uh, uh, have guilt there, uh, uh, did, did Haitians a real disservice. And, and that is perhaps a worst case example, but it is an example of the way that way too much USAID works. I'll just add two things. So, Maura, first of all, it's proof that things really do happen in government, that uh, three years or four years on, we can be sitting here and Charles can be praising Div when you and I both remember when Div had not yet been created. So things get done. You all have made a huge difference. I think I have two things I would say. One is, and perhaps particularly as the incoming president of New America and the recipient of, of aid grants, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the amount of compliance uh, and the amount amount of, of just sheer paper and legal assistance you need uh, to get a USAID grant is really a problem, not just necessarily for us, but more because it actually encourages a culture of large development contractors who then subcontract because many smaller innovative uh, entities who would actually be doing a lot of this innovation simply cannot possibly afford to, to handle an aid grant. So that's one. The second, though, is around hiring, and you and I both know this. I mean, if I could wave a magic wand, both aid and state would be able to take people in, have them for a couple of years, have them then work for a private corporation, an NGO, and anywhere else, then go back into USAID and essentially have a far more flexible labor market for not just the political appointees, it works, but for the civil servants and actually for the aid foreign servants. And we're, I don't think we're ever going to get to where we need to go unless you have people who've actually crossed cultural boundaries enough so they know how to assemble coalitions on the ground that can get things done. Andres? Thanks, Ramesh. Um, first off, I, I just want to uh, do an institutional plug here, and it's, it's very gratifying, Ramesh, for, to have you here, and Charles, and you mentioned you've been collaborating for a number of years, but I believe you, you met as fellow fellows at New America, and I remember a lot of spirited uh, thinking out loud sessions we had uh, where you guys first uh, connected, and the fact that you're, you're still here as part of our community is a testament to what the Fellows Program is trying to do. We, New America helped liberate Charles from the World Bank and, and, <laughs> and allowed him to pivot to become the, the public intellectual and bomb thrower that he is now. So uh, <laughs> congratulations. I was wondering, uh, and maybe we could start with you, Charles, if in one sentence each of you could talk about what will be the dominant issue we'll be, t we'll be wrestling with when we're gathered here in 2020. Why did you have to start with me? Uh, by the way, first of all, yes, thank you. The, the Schwartz Fellow Program uh, is one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Uh, it is not 
uh, just about uh, the, the money, which helped, but it is mainly about uh, the institution and the people. Um, Andrew is uh, uh, first and foremost amongst them. I mean, it's just uh, if, I had the best time ever, um, and, and I won one again. I won one again. Give me another one. Uh, so, so thank you. Um, but uh, on the, I, I mean, I think that really one of the big long-term challenges is, 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 is where people are and where um, the opportunities for them to have their best life is. And I think that's getting increasingly disconnected. So um, if you are an old person in the United States, this is actually a terrible place to be an old person if you're past retirement. Um, the health care is hideously expensive. The home care is hideously expensive. Um, you know, it, it's cold in a lot of the country a lot of the time. It's just, you know, n not a great place. If it was much easier for you to move to Mexico or, uh, or, or, or Thailand or, or one of many developing countries that have, you know, hospitals that are accredited to US standards and actually in many cases deliver a better, better standard of care for one-tenth the price, that would be good for you. And of course, if you're a young person and you're trying to go to college, college in this country is obscenely expensive. And we still have many of the best universities in the world in the United States, but there are a whole load of people in the United States who can't get into those universities. They could go to universities elsewhere that are delivering a really high quality of education, not as good as Harvard, not as good as MIT, but you know, up there, um, at a much, much lower cost where they could, they could go. So, there's a whole load of opportunities for US people to go abroad. This is more than one sentence, I'm sorry, I am about to stop. Um, and of course, obviously, the reverse holds true, right? There are a whole load of people who could massively benefit from being here. And I, I hope that the sort of big discussion of the, of, of the next 10, 15 years, starting with the um, discussion over immigration reform we're having right now, is you know, the increasing disconnect and idiocy of our, our current rules on the fact that where you are born has such a massive determination about how the rest of your life should go. I mean, how dumb is that? It's completely random. Um, and so if we could start moving the discussion, and I think for all sorts of demographic reasons, we will start moving the discussion in that direction. I'd love to be back in 20 years on a new Schwartz Fellowship talking about that. Steve? He took all of our sentences. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think that uh, 20, Andres, 2020, right? So, uh, a, 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 a more intensively fractured Middle East, uh, because the opinions will come out from under the uh, OPEC nations, the, 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 these anchors of the region, and a, a uh, much weakened Russia, and, uh, and a closer relationship with China. So quickly, um, I guess for some of the reasons that we've, we've mentioned here, I think authoritarian regimes just all over the world are just under a lot of strain. I think it's just much harder to be a traditional authoritarian regime. And I'm not saying that they're going to disappear, but I think we're going to see a lot of just transitions in, in that area. I'd say two things. One will be water refugees. Uh, we're going to be looking at the collapse, particularly if governments cannot pay uh, in the Middle East. But we're going to be seeing countries that are effectively out of water with populations uh, moving. Uh, and the second is, I think we, could, we may well be talking about some kind of uh, Western Hemisphere economic community. Uh, we will be finally realizing that our future in the United States lies as much north-south as it does uh, east-west, either across the Atlantic or the Pacific. I d I'm not just saying that because you're asking the question. I really believe it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, one, I think we have time for any, any more questions, just so we can bundle them all, if there are any others. There's one here. Let's just take them in, in succession, and then we'll uh, divvy thank, them up. Thank you. Um, I have a question, just because this panel is called Engaging the World. Um, one of the things I've been studying is sort of the civil military balance in our presence in the world. And I think one of the problems we're facing as a small d democracy that wants to be a leader is that a lot of the social capital, meaning collaborative relationship based influence, is in uniform right now. And this is for lots of different reasons. This is, you know, the military has discovered in Iraq and Afghanistan that government is a counterterrorism strategy, it's what Congress will fund. And Congress has also funded peer networks in uniform, unlike 
for 30 years now, unlike anything in the civilian side. And so I really feel like we have this imbalance, and we're either going to have to make peace with it as a democracy and start talking about posse comitatus again and who does what and everything from Boston to who can be most effective in other countries, you just keep seeing these uniforms appearing in this sort of militarized presence. And I feel like Americans are getting increasingly comfortable with it without a conversation about it. What do we do about that? Should I go ahead? Yeah, uh, for Steve, um, you made the point that there's going to be a lot of uh, surplus oil, and you also made the point that many of the producing countries have very high break-evens. Why should we expect them to not just simply shut in some of their production to maintain the price at levels which they need? And I think we have one more here. Um, Charles, this is for you. I'm wondering what you think about kind of a new movement in development aid, which is um, organizations like Give Directly, which transfer money directly into savings accounts of um, people in Kenya. Uh, so what do you think about that? Okay, so why don't you talk about oil, Charles, direct uh, charities, and then Emery, maybe you can um, finish with a big picture question about uh, our militaristic face around the world and how to change that. So, um, Steve. The, uh the reason is, is that uh, OPEC can shut in oil, but the calculus, remember, is price and number of barrels. So you shut in oil, you're selling fewer barrels at a lower, uh, maybe the price will go up, but you still, you still aren't earning the same amount of money. And, and in fact, you're earning, if the projection is correct, you're earning a lot less than you need for that break-even point to run the government. Charles. Um, the model of poverty which says the reason that poor people are poor is their fault is what leads to kind of the broad aid industry we have today. That model is wrong. Uh, the give directly model is poor people are fault, uh, poor because of the circumstances they are in, help them change their circumstances and they will do better. Give directly, gives them cash to help them do precisely that. I think it's wonderful. Uh, in one minute. So, you know, we wrote the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review and it was called Leading Through Civilian Power and you're telling me it had, didn't change everything? <laughs> I, 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 I'm crushed. <laughs> you know... I actually think one of the other things that's on the agenda, we haven't talked about it at all, but of course we are going about to go through the biggest military budget cuts we've certainly seen in our lifetime. And that is going to trigger so much reassessment, not only around what the military thinks it needs, but here's what's critical about the military's relationship with Congress, right? Because Congress, often you have the military saying, we don't want things, and Congress saying, oh yes, you do, because it benefits uh, us. So it seems to me you're going to have a rebalancing simply by virtue of, of the greater cost effectiveness of prevention, development, diplomacy, and because the traditional uh, ability and desire of the military to simply fund whatever it wanted to fund is, is going to be, be de decreased. That said, I think it is important to note that I just had a student write a paper on um, – how you stop or what have been the determinant factors when you've had military coups, uh, then civilian governments, when, how can you stop the military from taking over again? And that's obviously a huge question in Burma right now, if, assuming it becomes a non-military government, how do you stop that? One of the most cost-effective ways, and you know this, is embedding militaries of, of new civilian governments into professional uh, development networks. So th those, a lot of those networks do have value, the, the, but there's, the, the issue is how you preserve that, but take away the fact that, as you, you said, that our overall face is a military one. And yes, I'm the woman who's recommending military intervention in Syria. I do get the <laughs> irony of that, uh, but I'm not recommending staying for any length of time. Uh, well, let me just say the, the one, my one word answer to Andres's question is China, which is, of course, the uh, subject of our dinner conversation. Um, but for now, the bar is open. Thank you to this panel for an excellent discussion. Thank you.